Greetings. My name is Charles R. Sabo. I'm back doing another teaching video. I think it's a very important teaching video. It comes from the book of Ezekiel, my Bible commentary that I have done. And it's available online. I mean, it is hard. It's available in hardback binder and also ebook. I've chosen not to do it. In, no, actually, I did do it in a paperback as well. Um, but you can see that it's pretty hefty, um, needed to be hardback, really. Um, but anyway, here we go. Chapter four is very important and very misunderstood. And so I felt it important to bring to you um, because it determines some things that are important for the future of, uh, in this case, of Israel and for our knowledge um, as well being Christians. So I'm going to go over this with you so that you understand it because it is being mistaught on the pulpits and in commentaries. And so it's very important that you see this because it has determined um, future prophecies. So let's first go into the introduction uh, of chapter 4 of Ezekiel, my Bible commentary. Um, chapter 4 is a continuation of the initial service instructions for Ezekiel to carry out in front of his people. who are also being called his own house of Israel. So far, chapter 3 provided him with the first thing to say to them, which was, thus saith the Lord God. Now, with that in mind, I'm going to take you back to that. Uh, we'll go back up here to the last verse of chapter 3. But when I speak with you, I will open your mouth, and you shall say unto them, thus saith the Lord, or thus says the Lord. He that hears, let him hear, and he that forbears, let him forbear, for they are a rebellious house. Now, it is not very hard for Ezekiel to understand. Ezekiel is thoroughly being instructed to wait after this, after, uh, until God speaks through him and declares, thus saith the Lord, or thus says the Lord. The comment after this was not to be implied by Ezekiel to the people, but was stated in review of what the Lord had already implied within Ezekiel 2, 4 through 5. Ezekiel was to get their attention by simply stating, thus saith the Lord. Okay, the Lord reminded Ezekiel of what he had already said in verse 2, 4 through 5. The pronoun they refers back to the noun your house from verse 3 chapter 3 verse 24 the house of israel was also ezekiel's house um as as was the case in verse 245 the lord god explained to ezekiel that he was to deceive see declare thus saith the lord so the children of israel would know that he was a prophet among them chapters 2 through 5 the lord indicated that these children of israel will know that he was a prophet among them even if they do not hear nor forbear. A better word for the Hebrew noun sema is listen instead of the English verb hear. Though these rebellious people will hear the words, and um, it is questionable whether they will listen to the prophet. The the Hebrew verb translated as forbear is hedal, which is defined as to cease to desist. They were to cease and desist from the rebelliousness and worshiping idols and false gods. There's your context of what's coming. So, here we go. I'm going to continue with the introduction. They, they were a rebellious house and were not going to listen to Ezekiel because they had not listened to anything said to them before the captivity. All right. See that here in Ezekiel. Now, after chapter 4 picks up, we know that Ezekiel's opening words were to be, what they were to be, he was to de first declare, thus saith the Lord, so that they knew that he was a prophet of God among them. The Lord then provided Ezekiel in chapter 4 with instructions for the demonstrations of what they should expect to have happen upon the third and final Babylonian siege of Jerusalem. This is before the third wave of captivity by King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. Thus, the Lord was using Ezekiel as his mouthpiece to assure them that Jerusalem was to be destroyed. Okay, so here we go. Verse 1, after he says, Thus saith the Lord to them, You also, son of man, take a tile and lay it before you and portray upon it the city, even Jerusalem. The Hebrew noun that the translators interpret as tile is labino, which is defined as um, 
brick or tile. Now the Lord continued to command Ezekiel with an additional task. You also of laying a tile in front of him as a hypothetical as a hypothetical imaginary city which represented Jerusalem. Now Ezekiel used the Hebrew verb hekak, which is to mean portray, set, or govern. Right. So so far Ezekiel spoke out to the people of the Babylonian captivity and said, "Thus saith the Lord." Then he then set up a hypo hypothetical imagery city, imaginary city, upon a tile. A scenario was being conveyed while using a smaller scale city in order for the Lord to demonstrate the fate of Jerusalem. Okay, so that's pretty easy to su summarize, but uh, I just wanted to lay it out clear. Verse 2, and lay siege against it and build a fort against it and cast a mount against it, set the camp against it, set battering rams against it round about. Now, just like kids playing in the dirt, Ezekiel was to show the people of the hypo of a hypothetical situation, thus demonstrating to the people what God was planning to do to Jerusalem in the near future. In hindsight, we know that King Nebuchadnezzar had, had in fact laid siege against Jerusalem in, on of 9, 587 BC, it's off 9. Um, you can see that confirmed in Jeremiah. The typical military maneuvers in besieging a city was building a fort near or nearby the city, building up higher ground mount to look upon the city, set up a camp of soldiers along with the numerous batter rams, battering rams, I'm sorry, to bomb the city with boulders. A blockade is also used to stop food and supplies from coming in, which eventually causes desperation and eventually cannibalism. So that was the plan. Moreover, this is verse 3 of chapter 4. Moreover, take you unto you an iron pan and set it for a wall of iron between you and the city and set your face against it and it shall be besieged and you shall lay siege against it. This shall be a sign to the house of Israel. Now, God was using imagery to this aspect of the sign to the captives of Israel. So this is to the captives. The captives, the first and second, well, this is actually the second way that Ezekiel was uh, displaying this to the, the first captivity uh, or the first wave of captives um, where Daniel was is a different location. Now, God was using image, I already said that. Since God had Ezekiel playing in the dirt, he had him set an iron pan to represent the power of the Babylonian military. It would besiege the city of Jerusalem like a wall of iron had hit it. Since God had Ezekiel setting up the iron pan of iron, he had him face towards the image, imaginary city set up on the tile as if he was Nebuchadnezzar laying siege against Jerusalem. Okay, so playing in the dirt. Since the initial thing conveyed to the Israelis in captive was, thus saith the Lord God, the actions performed by Ezekiel were to be a sign or prophecy of the destruction of the city of Jerusalem and the temple. The metaphor set your face has biblical significance, which should not be taken lightly. In the past, God has spoken through other prophets using this expression. And there you can find it, right? Now, the expression typically means to focus. Now, Leviticus 26, 17 says, I will set my face against you, and you shall be slain before your enemies. That they hate you shall, they that hate you shall reign over you, and you shall flee when you, when, when, None pursues you, right? They're going to be just chickens and run. All right, so verse four. Lay you also upon your left side and lay the inequity of the house of Israel upon it. According to the number of days that you shall lay upon it, you shall bear their inequity. All right, so God commanded Ezekiel to act out bearing the inequities of the house of Israel. We must first understand that the house of Israel consists of all 12 tribes. Ezekiel was to lay upon his left side next to his hypothetical city of Jerusalem. Time, the time frame which Ezekiel was to lay upon his left side was 390 days, representing 390 years. All right, and he's going to explain that in the next verse of inequities. The inequity being addressed is not very specific. So pinpointing time frames being represented is very ambiguous. Please see verse 5 for a more detailed explanation. So here, here we go, verse 5. For or because, because I have laid upon you the years of their inequity according to the number of days, 
390 days, so shall you bear the inequity of the house of Israel. Verse 5 begins with the conjunction 4, which is interchangeable with the conjunction because, which means this is the reason explained by Lord, the Lord that Ezekiel must, be, must lay upon his left side. Ezekiel was to lay upon his left side next to the hypothetical city because the Lord set, laid the years of the inequity of the house of Israel. Notice it's not the house of Judah. It's not the house of the northern kingdom. It's the house of Israel, all 12 tribes upon him. There was to be 390 days, which represented 390 years of Israel's inequities. Not the northern kingdom. This is all of Israel, all 12 tribes. So now it's ambiguous because you don't know when the inequity started, but it'll end on that day of destruction, right? So you can count back in history. Now that we know what day it was um, destroyed of 9587 BC. Since it is to be determined that all 12 tribes of the house of Israel were guilty of inequity, then pinpointing the 390 years is difficult. It cannot be the time spent in Egypt, nor the wilderness journey, because the Lord already punished those children of Israel in the wilderness journey. They did not carry inequity into the promised land. We also know this 390 years of inequity cannot be the time that the northern kingdom was, to, was in existence. Because it only existed 255 years. See the logic here. It can't be, which so many want to plug these in. It's, it's not right. All right, now we're going to give you an explanation. King Solomon succeeded his father, David, in approximately 1016 BC, as per Christian historian J.R. Church. He's an historian. He's, died, he's the late J.R. Church now. He died about 12 years ago. The believed dates are presented by secular historians as 970 B.C. There is much ambiguity concerning the exact years of events since the separation between B.C. and A.D. had caused some historians to speculate different dates. Author slash historian J.R. Church presents a sound argument towards a conspiracy of bogus dates in history in order to cover up the accuracy of the Bible in the first advent of the Messiah. The sins of Israel and their idolatry began actually under King Solomon. And we're going to read you something from 1 Kings 11, 11 through 12. Wherefore the Lord said unto Solomon, For as much as this is done of you, of you, and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded you, I will surely rend the kingdom from you, and will give it to your servant. Notwithstanding, in your days, I will not do it for David, your father's sake, but I will rend it out of the hand of your son. So there we're becoming a little bit more specific. So the date starts the day that Solomon's son, Solomon's son takes reign. We will use the ending date, which was the destruction of the Temple of Solomon and the city of Jerusalem which was of 9587 BC. We will add 390 years to 587 BC and we'll come up with 977 BC, right? See the logic here. Now we're, we're in hindsight, so we can do this. J.R. Church indicates that Solomon died in 977, 976 BC. He was succeeded by his son Rehoboam, who caused the division between the 10 tribes and two in Judah. Jeroboam took ten tribes to the northern areas of the land, well, actually it was nine and a half, um, half the tribe of Manasseh, and was the first king in the northern kingdom of Israel, Jeroboam, not Rehoboam. Rehoboam remained king of Judah, right? Well, king of Israel, but then it became just Judah under Rehoboam. Now, follow me so far. When King Solomon had been committing adultery against God, the Lord prophesied to Jeroboam that he was going to give him 10 of the 12 tribes to rule over. We can find that in 1 Kings 11.38. And it shall be, if you will hearken unto all that I command you, and will walk in my ways, and do that which is right in my sight, to keep my statutes and my commandments, as David my servant did, that I will be with you and build you, you a sure house, but as I built for David, and I will give Israel unto you. He's, he's, God was promising this to Jeroboam because of Solomon's um, heresies. Okay, as the Bible states, Jeroboam caused Israel to sin. 
when he caused the ten tribes to rebel against the authority of the house of David. He caused the ten tribes to reject David's lineage and rebel against God's authority. Second, Jeroboam created high places and golden calves as idols for the ten tribes to worship. He did not want the Israelites to worship in Jerusalem or in God's temple. This signified, this signified a more complete rejection of God and his theocratic system. Uh, 1 Kings 15, 30, because of the sins of Jeroboam, which he sinned and which he made Israel sin by the provocation wherein he provoked the Lord of God of Israel to anger. Okay, so we move on. The northern kingdom continued to walk in the ways of Jeroboam through their entire 255 years until the Assyrians invaded their land and destroyed their cities while carrying many off into captivity in 722 BC is what I Come to, come to know. The reason it's always 722 slash 721 because um, secular years and biblical years aren't the same as far as new, the new year in a biblical year begins in uh, Tishri 1, which is in September. So that's why you always see the two day, two years when somebody's trying to transfer biblical years to uh, secular years. The influence of idolatry echoed throughout the land even after the Assyrian invasion. Even brought their, and even brought their religious practices to many of the southern kingdoms of Judah. Many in the southern kingdom of Judah, sorry. God had indicated in five verses of his disgust in what Jeroboam had done. And here they are. Right? Spoke of Jeroboam a lot. God's disgust. The 390 years of inequity should be associated with what Jeroboam had done to Israel which years range from 977 B.C. to 587 B.C., 390 years. When God destroyed Jerusalem and the temple, the end of the 390 years was of 9, 587 B.C., when Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed by the Babylonians, and the people of the southern kingdom went into captivity. The house of Israel. 12 tribes. It's the sin of the 12 tribes. All right. So there's your explanation of the 390 day inequities from Jeroboam to the destruction of the temple was 390 years. All right. When you have accomplished them, lie again on your right side and you shall bear the inequity of the house of Judah. This is just the house of Judah, not the 12 tribes. 40 days, the house of Judah, 40 days. I have appointed you each day for a year. So we have the same formatting. Each day represents a year. So the Lord then had Ezekiel roll over onto his right side to bear the inequities of the house of Judah for 40 days, which represented 40 years of inequity. Once again, this inequity is ambiguous within this verse, so we must first exclude what 40 years it is not. It is not the 40 years in the wilderness journey. Because the 40 years was a curse being put upon the disbelief of the Jews, therefore the punishment had been afflicted. He's not God only punishes once for inequities. I mean, in the physical world, there is an eternal judgment, uh, judgment day. It is not inequities performed by the wicked kings of Judah because their years add up to more than 40 years. Since we know that King Manasseh reigned 45 years as the father Hezekiah, after Father Hezekiah died. While there were several that had wicked king, while there were several other wicked kings of Judah. Okay, so it can't be uh, that time. We also know that God included all the years of Judah within the 390 years of inequity within the previous verse. See, it's not that. So it's in the future. After the first destruction of the temple, it's sometime in the future. So when did Judah sin after the first temple was destroyed? There's a, there's a time period where Judah sinned. Can, thinking of that now, logically, does it make sense? When did Judah sin? 40 years they sinned. Ezekiel was a prophet whom God used to convey many insights into future sins and recompenses for those sins. There was to be a 40-year period in the future when the house of Judah would sin a great sin. 
We know that when Manasseh, when, Manasseh, when Messiah Jesus arrived into Jerusalem in A.D. 30, he was born 3 B.C., died at age 33, he was riding the colt of an ass and was rejected by the people of the house of Judah. That was in A.D. 30. It was actually Nisan 10 of A.D. 30 where he rode in and called him the colt of an ass. He was crucified, tombed, and resurrected. Right? Got that there? He was seen by hundreds of witnesses after his resurrection. See this here? He, his sin atonement was accepted by God the Father, but rejected by Judah. For the next 40 years, the house of Judah continued to sacrifice in the temple in Jerusalem until A.D. Well, actually, off nine. Once again, it's off nine. Uh, this time, A.D. 70. The temple was destroyed on the exact day of nine of 587 B.C. and 70 A.D. In the exact same manner. In A.D. 70, the Romans destroyed the temple and the city. The great sin was their disbelief in God's Son, who, had, who was sent to be an atonement for sins. The great sin was the dis I said that. The temple was no longer to be used for sin atonement. This 40 year sin and the destruction of the temple and Jerusalem was a fulfillment of this Ezekiel 4 6 prophecy. It is very interesting that both punishments were the same, meaning the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, while both being accomplished on the 9th of Av. Not a coincidence. That's not a coincidence. Ezekiel 4, 7. Therefore, you shall set your face toward the siege of Jerusalem, and your arm shall be uncovered, and you shall prophesy against it. If you will notice, Ezekiel was to set his face towards the siege of Jerusalem in both cases. Whether on his left side or his right, his face was set towards the siege. In both the 390-year sin and the 40-year sin, the siege of Jerusalem occurred and the temple was destroyed. In the case concerning Ezekiel's arm, God was not specific to us whether he was to keep his right arm uncovered other only when he was on his left side or was his arm while on the other, either side. I does, he doesn't say that since it's after he discussed the, the left side. Maybe it's the right arm. Since we do not know that this prophecy, since we do know that this was prophecy and imagery be, being spoken by the Lord, we can refer to other places in the scriptures concerning God's arm of wrath. Many places refer to God's right arm, right hand, I'm sorry, right hand. But when it comes to his arm, there is never a designation towards right or left. Therefore, we must consider this to be both sides of Ezekiel's time was his arm to be uncovered. That's only logic. And it can be a presumption on my part. Assume, I'm not assuming, I'm presuming. Um, Deuteronomy 4, 34, or has God as a raid to go and take him a nation from the midst of another nation by temptations, by signs, by wonders, by war, and by, uh, by a mighty hand, and by a stretched out arm, and by great terrors, according to all that the Lord your God you did in Egypt before your eyes. So it wasn't a stretched out right arm. It was a stretched out arm of God. So it could have been on either side. He had the, the, uh, the arm that wasn't being laid on covered. Un I'm sorry, uncovered. Was it uncovered? Now I'm my, my uh, uncovered. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, my memory is terrible. Now, Psalm 89.10. You have broken Rahab in pieces as one that is slain. You have scattered your enemies with your strong arm. Once again, it doesn't say strong right arm or your right arm. It doesn't say left arm. It doesn't say anything about left or right arm. The pronoun it is connected to the pro proper noun Jerusalem here. The act of laying on both his right side and left side and keeping his left or right arm uncovered was acted out imagery as prophecy. This was an illustration to Jerusalem concerning its future which included two different destructions, the Babylonian destruction in 587 BC and the Roman destruction in AD 70. The imagery used was letting Jerusalem know that God's face was set towards it. The, his full attention 
while he was to bring his mighty arm against it, resulting in siege and destruction. So if you think about it, when he's laying on his left side considering Judah, the destruction by the Romans, it was God's right arm. When he was laying on his right side, his left arm was against Jew, Jew, Jerusalem to, for, for the 390 years of equity, if, if you want to use common sense. Um, Ezekiel 4, 8, And behold, I will lay bands upon you, and you shall not turn you from one side to another till you have ended the days of your siege. God was addressing Ezekiel, but within this prophecy, he was hypothetically speaking to Jerusalem. Ezekiel was to not move from the right to the left, except when the 390 day, 90 days had expired. But Jerusalem is being addressed here prophetically. The bands spoken of represented the bands spoken of represented the coming captivities, Babylonian and Roman, otherwise bands of restraint. Israel would be without their land and living under other kings, having no control over their situations until God's siege was over. God has metaphorically used the expression turn not from the right nor the left in many occasions. It typically means to stay on God's designated path and do not stay do not sway to the left of the left of center or right of center. Right? So, and you can see that here like Joshua 1:7 only be you strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever soever you go. Um, Isaiah 30, verse 21, and your ear, your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it, when you turn the right hand and when you turn to the left. Actually, the quote here, quote marks should have been put there. My bad. In both sieges and destructions of Jerusalem, the children of Israel ended up in captivity as well as scattered with, without their promised land. Here in Ezekiel 4, 8, God had commanded them to stay on his designated path while maintaining their obedience in him. The Roman destruction of Jerusalem and the temple kept them from their promised land for 1,878 years. They maintained their identities as children of Israel, and have reestablished Jerusalem in this last century. So they kept their identity, maintained their identity, and following the laws of Moses as they were commanded. Ezekiel 4, 9. Take you also, sorry, yeah, take you also into your wheat, your barley, and your beans, and lentils, and millet, and fitches, and put them in one vessel, and make you bread thereof, According to the number of the days that you will lie upon your side, 390 days shall you eat thereof. The prophecy is blended with the time of the inequity, 390 years, as a result of God's bands of captivity. A prophecy by the prophet Jeremiah revealed to Israel that the Babylonian captivity was the last 70 years. Therefore, the food that Ezekiel was to eat would represent the prison food of captivity for the 70 years. God commanded Ezekiel to eat this bread of desperation with, while he laid on his side for the 390 days. 390 days were the number of years of inequity. And so, and so we should assume that Israel did not eat this during their disobedience, but during their punishment. The bread was probably lo low quality at times. It was probably low quality, yeah. Uh, while other times was mediocre at best. Prison food isn't supposed to be enjoyable. The captives of the future sieges were going to make their bread just the way Ezekiel was going to do it within his demonstration. Okay? So he's demonstrating what they're going to be going through. And most of them was already going through this. Because um, they were already in captivity. They, they weren't eating luxuriously. They were they were eaten. And so this is imagery being used by the Lord. And your meat, this is verse 10, and your meat which you shall eat shall be by weight 20 shekels a day. From time to time shall you eat it. Mankind needs a source of protein every day in order to live. God was to have the Babylonians make sure that they would be getting a ration portion from time to time so they did not fall into starvation mode, which would cause cannibalism. This was not animal flesh being called meat here but the bread described in the previous verse 
common sense tells us that captors were not going to slaughter livestock, captors, the Babylonians, were not going to sla slaughter livestock in order to feed all of their captives, probably, you know, over, over a million. The beans with the grains were an adequate source of protein. Therefore, one should realize that the previous verse is linked here to this one. The 20 shekels was a little more than 10 ounces, which they would be given to eat from time to time. This was as close to starvation without dying as God was going to take them. Okay. Verse 11, you shall drink also water by measure, the sixth part of a hen, from time to time shall you drink. Okay, once again, the pronoun you is addressed towards Ezekiel, while Ezekiel is acting out the imagery of what the captives will suffer in the Babylonian captivity that was coming. This is um, still for the third captivity in the future, but these people are already going through this. Though there was not any... So not as many captives in the Roman destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, times were still very harsh for those taken captive. A hen was a unit of measure or container e equaling about five quarts. Therefore, from time to time, the captives would be given one sixth of a hen or five sixths of a quart. About five quarts, a hen, and they were given five sixths of a hen, a sixth of a quart, hold on, sixth part, the sixth part of hen, okay, did I do that wrong, I might have, they were given one measure container equal five quarts, they were going to get a sixth part of the five quarts, a sixth of a hen, oh, I, I did it right, the five sixths of a quart. Five sixths times six would be the quart, right? I think. Um, da, 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 five quarts, yeah. All right. Five quarts, yeah. Five sixths of a hen. Five sixths of a quart is a sixth of a hen, yeah. I got it right. I'm just questioning what my thought. The designated time frame, time to time, is unclear which most likely is because it could have ranged from one day to even three days of time between rationings. Verse 12, And you shall eat as barley cakes, eat it as barley cakes, and you shall bake it with dung that comes out of a man in their sight. The pronoun you pertain to Ezekiel while he acted out the imagery of what the captives were going to suffer during the two different captivities, Babylonian and Roman. Ezekiel was commanded to eat the mixture specified in verse 9, thus being called barley cakes, since it can be construed that the captors were only going to supply them with the ingredients of verse 9, Ezekiel was to demonstrate in their sight the method of preparation which the captors were going to resort to in preparing their bread, barley cakes. They're calling it meat in the previous in the previous verses um, they were going to have verse 10 i believe they were going to have to bake their bread barley cakes most likely in baking pan over an open flame since there was not going to be much brush or wood or even coal for such a magnitude of people to burn for their fire their fuel would have to be dried feces dung there would there, there would be no livestock livestock to gather dried feces from, so the reality would be that the captives would have to dry their own feces for fuel. That's what Ezekiel is supposed to be demonstrating, but here's what happened. And the Lord said, Even thus shall the children of Israel eat their defiled bread among the Gentiles where, wherever I will drive them. Though the laws of Moses never prohibited the use of feces as fuel for baking their breads, God still recognized the uncleanness of its use. The Hebrew word used for Ezekiel for defiled was teme, teme, which can also mean unclean place over the dirty fuel, right? The children of Israel were destined to live like this for 70 years of the Babylonian captivity, as well as an undeterminable time after the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. They would be living among the Gentiles for both time periods. One should notice that the Lord did not specifically provide a location wherever I will drive them, 
because they would be scattered in several areas during the 70 years, as well as uncountable places over the world during the 1879 years of their exile after the AD 70 destruction of Jerusalem. All right, so you can see where I'm going with that. Um, he's talking about both captivities. They're going to be uh, suffering through this. Then said I, oh, Lord God, behold, my soul has not been polluted for my for from my youth up even till now have I not eaten of that which dies of itself or is torn in pieces. Neither came their abominable flesh into my mouth. It was a com it was commonplace for people of the Middle East to use animal dung as their fuel for their fires due to the fact that they lived in the deserts with with very little brush or trees. Therefore, it was not such an offense for a priest to do as well, but Ezekiel was offended by the use of human feces as fuel, thus complained to the Lord for putting such a burden upon him. Ezekiel was most like would most oh, sorry. Ezekiel most likely lived entirely by the laws of Moses and never defiled never defiled himself. My soul has not been polluted by eating forbidden meats. Because of this, Ezekiel pleaded with the Lord for his mercy upon him. So he's asking for mercy. Then he said it to me, Lo, I have given you cow's dung for man's dung, and you should prepare your bread therewith. Ezekiel was a product of God's laws and driven to be righteous in his sight. Ezekiel seemed to be squeamish of the thought of using human dung as his fuel. The Lord God showed mercy on Ezekiel only and compromise, allowing him to use cow feces dung as his fuel for the fire for preparing his bread. There would be a scarcity of animals to acquire feces from during the 70 years of the Babylonian captivity. This was also a prophecy pertaining to the desperate Israelites of Judah after the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. So they realistically might use or potentially would use human dung, human feces, out of desperation because there weren't very many animals to find feces of. All right, so verse 16. Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, behold, I will break the staff of bread in Jerusalem, and they shall eat bread by weight and with care, and they shall drink water by measure and with astonishment. The context of the word staff and astonishment need to be evaluated. The Hebrew word used for staff was mate. Um, which means staff, branch, tribe. Uh, additionally, the definition is staff, figuratively, a support of life, right? So he's talking about it, the staff meaning a support of life. The Hebrew noun um, daiga was translated by the translators as care, when the Hebrew noun also can mean anxiety and anxious care. The children of Israel were cold, sick, and starving. It seems that their the use of the just of just the words with care might be a bit inappropriate when considering the the situation. These captives would be destined to eat their bread by pre-weight rations. Thus, they would be eat they would eat bread with anxious care. The house of Israel had fair warning even during the time they agreed to the Mosaic covenant. There, there's the warning in, the, in Leviticus right there. They were warned about it. Okay. As was commanded upon in verse 411, the captives will be given one-sixth of, of a hen or five-sixths of a quart of water. This designated time frame, time to time, is unclear which most likely is because it would could range from day one day or even three days of time between rationings the hebrew word simeamum was translated as astonishment which is a little misleading because the person can be a person can be positively astonished the hebrew word was simameon simameon I'm sorry, you know what I'm saying. It's better translated as dismay or appallment. The children of Israel were used to having an abundance of food and water to eat and drink daily, but during the future captivities, they would not eat bread nor drink water sometimes for days, so they would be appalled. 
not astonished. All right, verse 17. That they may want bread and water and be astonied one with another and consume away from their inequity. The translation was translated the Hebrew verb samian, samin, as astonied because they misused the word astonishment in the previous verse. The Hebrew verb samin was written by Ezekiel in the nephal form, which should be translated as appalled. So they shall and be appalled at one another and consume away in their inequity. Okay. The Lord announced that he will put the harsh conditions of scarcely rationed bread and water upon the children of Israel so that they may want their bread and water and be both irritable and appalled with one another. This would be their due punishment for their inequity of unbelief and disbelief in the Lord God of Israel. Here, the Lord indicated that these people would suffer and consume or waste away in their scarce rations. All right. And there you have it. We'll go move on to Ezekiel 5 after this. But a uh, very important chapter. I mean, the, the last part is it was uh, an explanation of what they had to eat. And we can use that for historical purposes. Uh, but the most important verses in this are verses 4-4, 4, 4-5, 4, 4, 4 6 and you can even add for four seven, but um, the time frame, the timing of the inequities. So many want to um, in, uh, include the say that the the sins of Judah and the forty days is separate, and is as the kings of Judah before that, and it's absolutely absurd. It's poor discernion. Uh, they're not discerning correctly the scriptures they're not identifying bible prophecy as it should be and so they've given you false prophet false prophecy from pulpits i'm correcting that right now god gave me and here in the last days the ability to discern this and research and get it done for you share this please so that this can be um known amongst the people so that they're not promoting false doctrines and um, hit like down below, subscribe to my channel, and until the next time, may God bless you and all the, in your families and your friends.